Welcome back to this week's walkthrough where we check off every single one of the most trending topics in your real estate industry. I am your co-host, Byron Lazine, along with Eric Simon, the Broke Agent. Welcoming back to the show, we have Daniel O'Neill. You may have seen Dan and not recognized him lately because he was wearing faux glasses. Dan has the thinnest skin in all of real estate. He is soft as Kleenex. Dan... Wow. From the O'Neill team, the number one team in Long Island. Welcome back to the walkthrough, Dan. Thank you. I appreciate that. You wrote that out, didn't you? You're waiting. No, to that. I didn't. But I, but I've been thinking about it all afternoon leading up to this show. We also have back on the walkthrough Tom Tool, the instigator who instigated <laughs> Dan's softness, who instigated his two week insane little you know drifting away from Bam. And Tom is the man in Philadelphia. My brother, Tom Tool, welcome back to the show. Hello. And if Dan can't learn to take a joke, you might be on the wrong show is my, my guess. So, so Dan, how upset are you that you didn't get an acknowledgement at the BAM bash? You, you have been a psychotic example of yourself the last couple of weeks, just <laughs> lashing out like a child everywhere possible. Uh, that vlog that you put together... You know, you lashed out on that. I saw that. It might have been the worst vlog you've produced yet. Oh and God. and I ju and I just uh, I want to know where your head's at, Dan. I, I'm I'm here reaching out to you as a friend. Yeah. So I guess I walked into this one, huh? Um, yeah. I mean, it was it was a joke. Uh, I thought it was a great vlog. I, I shouted you guys out. I was super happy. Tom Tool and I were joking around that you shouted everybody out except for for me and Tom. There were a lot of drinks involved. Clearly. And uh, yeah, did me and Tom, uh, Uncle Tommy Tool over here, talk about starting our own media company? For sure, yeah. Uh, but, but it was a, a drunk conversation, and I think I left one YouTube comment. Uh, there's nobody that believes more BAM than me. There's nobody that has BAM. I'm the only person that has a BAM tattoo, number one. Yeah. Where uh, is it? Yeah, you know, I'm just... Uh... <laughs> Tom's dying. <laughs> Tom. Yeah, by the way, Tom, I heard, you, laughing Tom, I heard you were snickering in the corner at the BAM bash with Dan. Mumbling to people, what, uh, whispering, saying, what? you built this company, <laughs> you put together a couple <laughs> blog posts, and you act like you know you, you should be co-hosting the walkthrough now. This is insane. So yeah, this is an ambush. So, so Eric, let's, why be, don't you, let's be very clear. Let's why don't be we, very clear. Hold on, hold on, Tom. Eric, what, every, let everybody know what actually happened. For okay, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened. About. So yeah. we had the band bash in Dallas. There was maybe 900 people trying to get into the party. <laughs> we're giving speeches. You know, Cocktails were flowing, of course. You know, Byron very graciously thanks everybody for being there. Thanks the Bammers, the contributors. And this is, again, this is a, a two-minute speech. This is not the Academy Awards. He doesn't have a list in front of him of, you know, his parents and everybody to thank for literally throwing a party. And, yeah, he didn't mention Tom Tool and Dan, who were in the corner already poking and prodding us. And then in my speech, I didn't thank anyone. I just said, this is great. This is a sick party. Everybody get hammered. And then for two weeks, we heard nothing from these two hooligans about how they're underappreciated and they didn't get their no thanks, acknowledgement, no acknowledgement. And it's just like, you know, this was this was just a party that we were throwing here, fellas. We do appreciate you. We love your contributions. Thank you. So I was looking. For so I, I believe this all stemmed from us joking around. And I said. Uh, Dan, I guess we're chopped liver. Ha ha ha. And then set me off. I must have set Dan off. I mean, maybe he's had like a bad experience with chopped liver in his childhood. <laughs> maybe his parents fed it to him. He's scarred for life. I don't know. I'm probably one of the bigger ball busters you're ever going to meet. And yeah. it starts with this guy right here. So there is no ill will whatsoever. <laughs> now, I can't speak for Dan in Long Island, but, uh, you know, I, I think he's chopped liver PTSD is the problem. Listen, we are all here. All of our hands are up. There is no ill will. It was a it was a joke. Brian, put your hands up. And, uh, happy to be back. Well, put your hands up, because Brian. no, I'm not under arrest. Like, oh what, what am I? Put, put my hands up for what? What is this? Some type of cult we're in now? Uh, I've known Tom to be one of the thickest skinned individuals in the real estate industry. Uh, you know, we throw a lot of heat at each other, but 
hit that thumbs up button if somebody in your office right now is popping to mind as one of the thinnest skinned individuals. <laughs> Every everybody knows one of these people in real estate, and Dan, you're the poster child for it. So, oh my God, never yeah, mind. There is there is ill will now. There is the, ill will. I it doesn't mean grinding. I won't golf with you, although you owe me my money still, but you know, yes, I, haven't gotten I, that. I do owe you money. We should talk about the fact that I did beat you. I did put up a 78 on Eric's head. Uh, but listen, again, there is nobody that has bled more for BAM aside from you guys and whatever than me. So I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear any of this. All right. I am bought in to BAM since day one. All right. The hatchet is Tear, buried. Let, tears are not, to tears are not bleeding. Oh, the hatch! I don't, I don't bury hatchets. I carry them with me. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna be a hunchback one day, carrying oh all these God. hatchets around. Byron right, would do well in the Walking Dead universe. He would just, he would always remember things and just kill people sight unseen. <laughs> would, you, you, you'd do well. You would be running like the place, like Negan. It would be great. <laughs> I'll never forget it, and I'll never forget this week in history. This feels like the week where everything is changing for us. All right, so let's get serious and jump into the first topic. Jerome Powell, the Fed, says the U they pointed out the US housing market specifically. He made it a point to discuss the housing market during his talk this week. And he said US housing is headed for a correction. Quote, when I say reset, I'm not looking at a particular specific set of data. What I'm really saying is that we've had a time of red hot housing market all over the country. Famously, houses were selling to the first buyer at 10% above the ask, even before seeing the house, that kind of thing. So there was a big imbalance between supply and demand. Houses were going up at an unsustainable fast level. So the deceleration in housing prices that we're seeing should help to bring prices more closely in line with rents and other housing market fundamentals. That is a good thing. For the longer terms, we need supply and demand to get better aligned so that housing prices go up at a reasonable level and a reasonable pace, and people can afford houses again. We in the housing market probably have to go through a correction to get back to that place. Longer run, uh, longer run issues with the housing market. It is difficult to find lots close enough to cities, so builders are having a hard time getting zoning and lots of workers and materials and things like that. But from a business cycle standpoint, and here it is, this difficult housing correction should put the housing market back into a better place, Powell told reporters on Wednesday. Tom Tool, what does that message say to you? It sounds like Jerome Powell wants to crash the housing market. I mean, that, that, that's very clearly what he's saying. There, there's a challenge here. Is he going to force people to sell their homes? Because this has been driven by inventory. There's not as much inventory that's been out there, although it has risen by about 30% in our marketplace. I don't, if he keeps raising rates, people are still going to move. They've, they've moved in the past when rates were 14, 15% in the 80s. I, I don't understand what his thought process is here. And when you turn down the number of transactions, because we've seen a big drop in the number of transactions, housing makes up 17% of the GDP in the country. So it's not just housing, it's going to affect a lot of other sectors in the market and ultimately the economy. So it sounds like he wants to crash the market. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't really interpret it any other way. I agree with you. He clearly is sending that signal. We will crash the housing market at all costs necessary. He's saying that in plain English, really to me, for the first time, which is why I'll remember this moment going into 2023. We'll be reflecting on it, much like we've reflected on times of the past with the GFC. Daniel, you can put your glasses back on if they're not and answer this question how do you see jerome powell's message impacting the 2023 housing market yeah i think it's a uh I, I agree with the both of you and i think it's also something for us as agents to be aware of that i think he was mentioning or in one of the articles here there's going to be a six 16.2 percent decline um there's 1.5 million agents right now right the amount of deals that transpired in 2021 to 2022 and now to 2023 are going to diminish a lot, right? I have the numbers here. I think it's going to be 6.9 million uh, from 5.71. So there's still going to be 1.5 million agents. There's going to be a lot less transactions, a lot less sales. So now more than ever is the time to be the knowledge broker, to educate your clients, 
and we were in a, an easy market the last couple of years, in, in my opinion, right? It, it was it was weird the last few years. Now we're getting to a normalized market, something that we are used to. And again, 1.5 million agents, 1.5 million agents, there's going to be a lot less transactions. Who's going to survive and, and who's going to be doing the right thing? I mean, being the knowledge broker, I mean, that, that is going to have to be the standard. You're going to have to know your stuff walking into this. That the next level, Tom, tool is you're going to have to make double, triple the amount of outbound calls that you've made in the past during an easier market. That's inclusive of that 30 year vet. That's inclusive of somebody with a big Rolodex. You know, your conversations got to go way up. People need this communication. Another thing that was very interesting that he said, and I don't know if you guys caught this um, in some of the information that you were reading on this Fed report. He said, if, if it means that we have to disrupt the employment industry, meaning employment is good right now, there, there isn't high unemployment. He's saying, now we never want to see you know, less people having a job. We will create an atmosphere basically where there's going to be layoffs if it means getting inflation down to 2%. He said that very clearly yesterday. I was surprised by that because what he's saying is we will disrupt this economy in such a way that people will lose their jobs. We would rather see if it comes down to it, people lose their jobs than us not getting to 2% inflation. They will trade 2% inflation for more people losing their jobs. When you hear that, when I hear that, I know that that means for the first time, houses are actually going to go down in price. People lose their jobs. People get backed into a corner. They've got to make a move. Am I right or am I right, Tom Tool? I've been through this before. I mean, and I think that there, there is a lot of value to this. In 2008, people were losing their jobs. And you know what happened? Prices went down. It, it was the same thing. And the only unfortunate part of this is this is being forced on us by policy rather than bad business decisions with banking, which were supported. So you start to see unemployment. That, that's been the certainty throughout all this. But unemployment drops. People don't know where their next paycheck's coming from. That's where demand pulls down. And then all of a sudden, supply starts to creep up a little more and a little more. And the, the, the vulnerable parts of the market here aren't going to be those, those, those lower-priced homes, those first-time buyer properties, the move-up and the premium price points. That's where I predict we're going to see the biggest amount of, of, of softness here. Like Eric said, Jerome Powell is soft in his post-it note he held up. Sorry. But that's like it's going to be those higher price points that really are, are the challenge. And it's not going to be like people think like when I say like move up, it's like, you know, a higher number. I'm talking like four to six hundred, which is the bread and butter for what we do here in our marketplace. So, it, it, I mean, this is concerning. No, no, no question about it. And if agents aren't getting informed, like Dan said, and upping their game and upping their ante, they're going to go out of business and the number of agents are going to drop. I mean, that's the other thing I see happening. Well, there, there's some stuff, but 800,000 agents haven't even done one real estate deal this year, which is yeah. crazy. psychotic. So there's, there's imagine been, like but, you go home to your wife and be like, Hey, it's, it's October. Still haven't sold the home yet, but I'm working hard. I mean, like what, what are you going to do? And so, so, and, and the other point was it was very easy in the marketplace. I think there's a lot of spoiled agents who got into the business 2020 or later and don't know what it's like to nurture someone for six months in the hope you get a listing appointment or work with a buyer for eight months and they may not even buy a house. So those qualification and motivation identification skills are going to be critical for the people that take market share as we head into 20 or start doing those report and, and cards like we talked about, Tom, where you have to update your seller on the amount of showings you're getting on the amount of Zillow mm, yeah. hits you're getting your property websites, your emails, your showing requests, like you're going to have to be showing your seller all this information on a consistent basis that gets extremely tedious. And none of these agents have experienced that they just got into the business. We did, we did those for years. It was actually in my yep. listing presentation because other agents weren't doing it and they were expired out for the second and third time. And it's like, hey, I'll guarantee my communication. This is one of the three checkpoints in my communication guarantee. Guys, communication guarantees are coming back, <laughs> meaning I'll sign you for a year listing, but you're going to get these three things from me every single week. A phone call, that report that uh, Eric just and there's two reports, really. It's it's the report of the online activity and it's the report of the marketing practices that we're doing. You'll get those three things from me every single week. If I miss a week, you can fire me on the spot. I used to put that into my contract. 
those are coming back in a big way because the agents that Eric talked about, the 800,000 that don't sell a house, the ones that are opposite of what Dan said, opposite of the knowledge broker, the ones that are afraid to pick up the phone call, those are going to be the ones that are not communicating. And when a house sits on the market, a seller's number one complaint is that they never hear from their agent because that agent doesn't know what to say to them because they're not all in on their business. They're not training. They're not getting the coaching that they need. They're not be you know crafting the skills that's necessary in a changing market. I'll say this too, agents, that there's so many things that we need to do. It starts with recognizing that the hours you put in the last two years aren't going to be enough over the next 12 months. You're going to have to go deeper into your commitment on this business. And you're going to have to start sending the, the message out to buyers right now. Hey, a house that's on the market for 60 days is a gift to you. This is a good thing. It's giving you more time to think, more opportunity to look. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with the house. A lot of people think 60 DOM means there's something wrong on the house. N not the case. Any final thoughts on this? Because the next topic plays off of this and, and you know what's happening with the 10-year treasury this week. But any final thoughts on just the Fed specifically? I think that's it. Tom, would you rather have dinner with Jerome Powell, Eric Simon, or Mike Ferry? Wow. I mean, there, there's an obvious choice here that Eric Simon all day yeah. long. I mean, oh, yeah. there, there, there's no... I went to one Mike Ferry event once and I felt like I was going to a meeting of like the Sith with the dark side. <laughs> you ever saw Senator Palpatine? He kind of looks like him. Summer. It was like, I, I was like, oh my God, it was, it was the craziest thing. So uh, in the I comments, would go hit number two and then number three, obviously Jerome Powell, he'd be last. In, in the comments, if you've been to a Mike Ferry event and you disagree with Tom Tool, or if you agree, love to know your experience at the Mike Ferry event. Let me be clear. Mike Ferry knows what he's talking about, and I use his scripts. It just, of course. Being a Tom Ferry coaching client, it was a different. It, it was a different sort of vibe. Oh, you mean there. like how many? How many Mike Ferry like this? Sith, you Tom, is that what you're referring to? Darth Maul, no, right Senator there? Palpatine. With the, with well, the Senator Palpatine campaign, you know, is yes. the mentor of Darth Maul. There you go. Yes, yes, that's exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Eric, how much is that worth? Uh, probably more than Tom's entire real estate business, I would say. <laughs> Probably not. This thing's probably worth five cents. I took it out of the package. I had to play with it. I just had to. And then you put it back in the Correct. package. Correct. Yes. For moments like this. Would you super glue it? Yeah, I super glued it. In case if, I want to flip if you're it on eBay. Listening, FBI's profile for most if you're listening to and not watching. Killer, that's number By the way, one. I got a Chewbacca Eric, right here as well, in case anyone's interested. Eric has the wrestling, the wrestling figure version of Star Wars. Yeah, that is um, a Chewbacca. If you ever bought a Hulk Hogan, a Hulkamania wrestling figure. I'm also selling this portrait of Miles painted by <laughs> Anne, if anyone yeah. is interested right. in that. All right. The the broke agent tag sale is now over. We're moving on to topic number two, the 10-year treasury. Bobby, if you could put that CNBC chart up. In response to Jerome Powell's message to the markets this week, you have seen the 10-year treasury just absolutely skyrocket up. Um, you, you see that it did almost get to this point in June. And now uh, I'll, I'll just say it, Tom. I'll be the first to say it. We're going to see 7% mortgage interest rates. This is what you watch when you want to know what's going to happen with the mortgage interest rate, not necessarily uh, the federal interest rate, but the 10-year treasury. And this is continuing to skyrocket. We've seen that mortgage interest rates are up over six for the first time since 2008. And I believe before the end of the year and probably sooner than later, we will touch 7%. That number concerns me greatly, a 7% mortgage interest rate. I never thought we would get into the sixes this year. When I'm looking at the data, the projections, it looked like we would definitely get into the mid fives and the high fives. And that felt pretty, you know, going up three points in a year felt like, okay, it's a big jump. But rem remembering back on the past, 5% is not a big deal. I said, we get over six, that's going to hurt a lot of people. It's going to impact, especially where prices are at, the ability to purchase. We get to seven. I'm not saying every everything is like sky completely falling down, but you are going to hear some crickets when you're reaching out to your database. Tom, 7%, do you think that'll happen? So... 
a lot of people are revising their predictions right now. I, I think what's going to really tell what, what happens here is not so much the initial reaction after the meeting, but talk to us in like a week or two, because the market typically settles down a little bit. There is some reactionary adjustments. I was just talking to our lender about this earlier today. Um, Lauren June thought they were going to stabilize rates. So did Danielle uh, Hale, the chief economist at Realorder.com. So I, I a lot of people like you have been proven wrong here. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see seven right now. I mean, when you got the person who sets the key interest rates that influence the 10-year T-bill saying we're going to crash the housing market and not those words, how do you crash the housing market? You raise the cost of money and they have the ability to do that. So it, it, it's, it's, it is definitely in the, on the table right now. No question, no question about it. F- Fannie Mae just came out and to your point, Tom, revised their projections for 2023. So Fannie Mae, mortgage rates no longer projected to ease. They had them dropping down in quarter one of 2023 to 5.3%. And about 5.3% in quarter two of 23, 5.1% by quarter three of 2023, and back down to an even 5% in quarter four. They're now saying their projections are above 5.5% throughout 2023. That This chart here uh, from Fannie Mae does not even show that they're, in, they're at 6%. So... I couldn't read that, Eric. What, what were Wasn't you for you, right? Fannie Mae is a criminal. Yeah, Fannie Mae. Well, no, I don't want to get audited here, but you know, <laughs> talking about government agencies, but Fannie Mae has been known to do some shady things in the past. Anyways, th- this is what Fannie Mae is is projecting. So um, I, I think nobody knows what the hell is going on when when you talk about these interest rate projections, these mortgage rate projections. And 7% feels like it's coming to me. If that happens, we got a BAM article we'll put into the show notes. Sellers will lose their advantage and have lost their advantage as mortgage rates have cracked six. And certainly if they get up over 7%, Dan, when you're talking to sellers, you go on a lot of listing appointments all over Long Island. Mm -hmm. When you're speaking with sellers, people preparing to get their home listed for the market, are they in like la la land with the reality of the state of the market? And what do you need to do to walk them back into mm-hmm. reality where buyers are starting to get more of the control? Yeah, I think it's just setting that expectation right from the very beginning, being the knowledge broker, as we mentioned earlier. And our, our market right now, it, there's only a month worth of inventory. So we're still in a seller's market, right? The absorption rate. Um, and we're kind of just telling everybody to put their house on the market now and and price it aggressively to get as much activity. We just put out a $1.2 million house and we were actually able to sell it in six days for $100,000 over asking, which granted we haven't seen in, in some time. But, um, and what we're saying to buyers really is imagine if rates were eight or 9%, right? Like, are you going to wait until that that's a potential reality? The same way that we didn't think that they would be at 7% or, or mid sixes. Um, you know, right now it's still the seller's market. It's still a supply and demand issue. Um, I don't know what it's going to be in six year, uh, six months or a year. But right now, there's not enough inventory, right? There's, it's the ebb and flow. Um, we're suggesting arm mortgages. Um, we are educating ourselves with our lenders and talking to them about different products to then speak with our buyers. And there are still people my age that need to buy. There are still people that have to sell, whether they're getting divorced, whether they're having kids and they need to buy or they want to move to Florida. There are still real estate transactions happening. And I think it's just a matter of educating uh, our consumers and our clients and being, like I said, the knowledge broker. Well, I, I have a little shiver when I hear arm mortgage for the regular average typical home buyer, just because of my experience in, you know, 04 through 08, Tom mm-hmm. tool, what is arm mortgage? Like, does that give you a shiver or does that give you a feeling of comfort over there with your green light? <laughs> Actually teal be clear. I think you're colorblind. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, it, to be the knowledge broker, it's about presenting options to your clients. And some people, they're never going to get an adjustable rate mortgage. You're never going to do it. There's other folks that I know we're dealing with. We literally just came from a team meeting about this where the first time home buyers priced a little out right now, a seven year arm, they may only live in the home for seven years or a 10 year arm. And you, there, there's real savings on these. I mean, our average sale price is $425,000. So, Right now, we're getting quoted six and a half. That's $2,149 a month in principal and interest. 
a 10-year arms at 6%, that's $2,038. A seven-year arms at five and three quarters, that's $1,984 in principal and interest. And a five-year is at five and a half at $1,930. So, I mean, you're talking about 200 plus dollars in savings for some people. That may be the only way they get into a home and get out of a rental. So with inventory like Dan's talking about, you know, it's, you're still going to see appreciation. I mean, this KCM data is out there. They're pulling all the major agencies, Fannie Mae, the Mortgage Bankers Association. And until that inventory rises, there's going to be less buyers coming to the market. I'd imagine inventory rises quicker with higher rates because there's less buyers. But there's some people. And one thing I learned in 2008, motivation matters. They're going to buy or sell a home no matter what. And they're going to transact. So until that inventory rises, that may be a viable option for some people to get into a home instead of paying their landlord's mortgage or something else. So it, it's going to be about motivation for agents. And you've really got to qualify that a little more and understand and then just present options and let the consumer make the decision, but present it in a way they can understand. And that way is monthly payment, not interest rate. Hey, I, I'll even ask you this, Byron, do you, do you lease or do you own your car? I own it. Okay, Tom, do you lease or do you own your car? I own it. Yes. Jesus Christ. Well, if somebody said that they leased their car, which Eric, do you? I don't even car? have a car. How about that? Okay. Well, <laughs> that's why I didn't even ask you. But Byron, I would ask you this: Do you know for the people that have a leased car, do you know what your money factor is? Most people don't realize that when they lease a car, they're they're actually they have a rate, right? They just know what their monthly payment is right off the top of their head. Oh, my my payment seven hundred, seven fifty. So it's kind of the same thing with with buying the home. You can't really look at the rate as much as you have to look at the monthly payment and what you can afford. Yeah, I, I've gone down. I used to lease a car because there are some advantages from a business perspective to leasing. And, and then the more I would listen to, to the old school cat, Dave Ramsey, I was like, he, you know, when he starts talking about, you know, he, listen, he doesn't know any freaking people with any kind of money that are doing something, you know, special with their lives that don't own their car outright. And I'm like, dude, he, he's so right. The other thing is if you want to invest in a lot of real estate, you want to, if you're an agent right now and you want to capitalize on this winter and being able to go and buy up some of these deals so that you can actually be the agent that's practicing what you preach and investing in real estate and you have a lease payment because you, you've been riding around in your white BMW and you've got an $800 lease payment, you're holding yourself back from being able to go out and get a loan from a bank because they're going to look at the $800 and you know it agents that's debt to loan income ratio, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it's going to hold you back from buying houses. So uh, I would go and just get a car that you can afford to pay off in its entirety and, and drive that around. All right. Here's a few more indicators and then we'll move on. And this is right from the BAM article. Fewer, fewer people are searching homes for sale on Google. Uh, during the week ending September 10th, searches were down 26% year over year. It speaks to the stat that Dan mentioned uh, earlier where we've got basically a 25% drop in the amount of homes that are going to sell this year in comparison to last year. Redfin seasonally adjusted home buyer demand index measuring requests for home buying services involving Redfin agents is down 11% from a year ago. I don't feel bad for them. Touring activity as of September 11th is down 14% from the beginning of 2022 compared to an 8% increase a year ago. Mortgage purchase applications for the week ending September 9th are actually up first time in six weeks, 0.2% from the week before, but they're down 29% year over year. And when you see that and you see what's going on with these actual mortgage payments, Bobby, if you could put up uh, that first KCM chart which shows you the mortgage payment to income ratio for the first time since 2006. And you keep hearing this for the first time since 2008, this is the first time since 2006. Uh, the mortgage payment to income ratio has crossed over the 25%. This assumes a 30 year fixed rate mortgage with a 20% down payment on a median price home with a median income. Now, if I said that on TikTok, if I said a uh, 30 year fixed rate with a 20% down, uh, you would have a thousand people saying nobody can afford 20% down. So Tom, is this not even the normal like request from a buyer putting 20% down? They typically want to put less than 20% down. So the unaffordability right now is at an all time high. When we look back on the last 20 years And the next chart from KCM, will speak to this. You can see in April, 2020, just a little more than two years ago, 
the monthly mortgage payment was $1,020. When everybody was being told that they shouldn't be buying, houses are, are getting too high in price. Well, they're paying a thousand bucks on their mortgage. And in June of this year, it's $1,944 on that monthly mortgage payment on average. That's according to NAR. So th these charts here don't paint a good picture for buyers. But when I'm going into the living room, when I'm sitting at the dining room table across from a seller and they want to list at yesterday's prices and they expect that there's going to be this incredible demand, this incredible buyer demand knocking at their door at the open house. These are the charts I want to show them. This is called the reality of what we're dealing with in 2022, quarter four. And as we get into 2023, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, I do believe some markets won't drop you know, precipitately in price, but there will be some markets that do. Any final thoughts there, Tom Tool? So, I mean, I, I've had these tough conversations with sellers before, and I, your, your point earlier about what are you doing to sell my home, the communication reports, the data, agents got to get schooled on this stuff. And there's going to be some people that get eaten alive on these appointments. Uh, it doesn't matter how seasoned you are. Strong markets can create weakness with a lot of real estate agents. It's happened. So you've got to bone up on your stats. You've got to practice your presentation. And you've, you've got to qualify people and see how serious they are about moving. I, I can't stress this enough. I mean, we came out, we did, I did an article for BAM about the recession power rules for real estate. Number one is motivation matters because someone's out there to get a price or they're moving because they want to. I mean, think about this 7% rates on a jumbo loan. They were at like three and an eighth two years ago on a jumbo loan. I mean, and so that, that, that part of the market is going to be even tougher. So it's, about asking the right questions, back to basics, follow the process, all the stuff you're told to do and by coaches and trainers, you got to actually do it or you're going to be spending a lot of time not selling houses. Tom, how often have you asked the seller on a listing appointment, who's going to buy your house? And they give you an example of who they believe the buyer is. And then if you can ask them and just be curious and ask them what they're seeing, they know their neighborhood. Hey, you know, in this neighborhood, you know, where does your neighbor work? Where does that neighbor work? What are the job titles of the community here? And so you can kind of figure out an average income and then you can walk them through like this KCM chart that we just showed you what the mortgage payment's going to be on their particular house. What, what, how much the mortgage payments are going up right now. And you've got to take that into consideration when you're selecting the price to go to market with to attract the most buyers to get the most money possible when you go to close on the property. So I would be using this data on every single listing appointment. I'd go down to the link below, try kcm.com forward slash bam. You can try it out for free. We've got the best link for you to get this data. Try kcm.com forward slash bam. You can also try their video product, which would take these charts, put them into your video. So you can send that to your database. You don't have to think it's all scripted out for you. Uh, when I say you don't have to think, that leads me to our final topic, which Eric's <laughs> going to kick off for us. So good. Yeah. And this is <laughs> so the great transition, newest Brian. social media app that you need to know about. What is it, Eric? You know, your ignorance in this topic is really astounding. You consider yourself a social media expert, a media expert, but mm -hmm. the fact that you don't see what's coming with this app is really disappointing, Byron. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the app is called yeah, usually when, when you're saying a lot of BS, you know, no, it's because I was just in Florida, uh, filming a bunch of videos and you have a vent protruding from your ceiling that was shooting freezing toxic air in my face. So of course I came back with a cold. I hope that is happening like to you new, right you know, now. And then you're experiencing that, by the way, I feel look fantastic. at my love KCM, um, you know, thing right here I have on my shirt. So. I may go light up a cigar immediately after this. I feel so yeah. good. All right. Well, that's fantastic. So this app is called Be Real. It is now the number three app in the app store. And this is a social media app that is taking the world by storm right now, especially with Gen Z. I don't know if you guys are on it yet. I just downloaded it yesterday and my fiance is on it. She's obsessed with it. All my friends are on it and obsessed with it. I think it has over 700 million downloads already. So to ignore this would be a fool's move. What it does is it notifies you twice a day and you upload a photo of exactly what you're doing, front facing and forward facing camera. And it's just a raw photo of what you're doing. It's not glamorous. It's not, there's no filters. 
There's no editing, nothing like that. So it's basically just like a picture of me, you know, working at my computer and then whatever is happening in front of me. And what it does is it takes away all the guesswork for social media. It takes away all the vanity metrics of social media and it takes away all the creativity of it as well, which I don't know if I like it that much yet, but people love it just because you get to see what everybody is doing in real time and you have to upload a photo in the first two minutes. Otherwise you can't see other people's feeds. So I wanted to get your guys thoughts on this. Um, you know, I, it sounds stupid right now, I guess, because it's like, well, you know, what's the point of this? Like why would real estate agents want to use this? But you have to remember all these apps take something from each other. All these apps evolve. Yeah. Snapchat became Instagram stories. Uh, TikTok became Instagram reels and TikTok last week implemented TikTok now, which is, you know, once a day, you'll get a notification. You can actually upload exactly what you're doing with no filters. So all these other apps are already taking notice. Eric, I haven't downloaded it yet. I certainly will. Uh, I mean, when when something ends up number three on the Apple App Store for you know topping the charts of the top 100 apps, you have to start paying attention to it. So I will. I'm spending all my time right now on Rumble, and when I'm done with Rumble, oh I'll get God. over to Be Real. <laughs> but <laughs> of course you um, are. But but do you consider this a direct competitor to Snapchat, which is? direct messaging it's mostly used for direct messaging with your friends i'd say it's kind of a combination between instagram stories and snapchat right now because it is that raw quick thing but and it is just between your friends but there isn't really a messaging aspect to it so you can react and you could comment but there is no messaging okay, but, feature yet but you're not like getting followers and likes like you would on TikTok or Instagram. You're not accumulating followers, am I no, right? No, but you could accumulate friends, which I guess technically would be similar to followers. So you'll see all these people in your feed, but yeah, you don't like have a follow count and that may come down the road. But I could see this being really cool for agents because everyone sees an agent's lifestyle on Instagram and TikTok and they think it's glamorous and they think we're just showing mansions all day and driving nice cars. But if our clients could actually follow us and see like, oh, I'm sitting at my computer in my office again, here I am doing, you know, reading an inspection report, here I am typing up an offer, here I am at an inspection, something like that. I think that raw aspect of it can eventually translate to real estate marketing. And worst case scenario, like even if people aren't consuming it on the app, I think you could screenshot what's going on in the app and upload that to Instagram story. And that creates intrigue, that creates like another type of content bucket that you could do. Well, Bobby's chirping from the uh, from the gallery over here. He's like writing in the chat. No, I don't know why he didn't just turn his mic on. We'll, we'll ask. No, 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 so, no. so Gary V called this a few years ago. He has an Instagram post where he <laughs> talks about where he talks about the the <laughs> scarcity and the value of posts. I was getting to this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I don't care about Gary V's predictions. Well, you should care about Gary V's predictions you're, because you're everything he's predicted social media wise media has come to fruition. No, he, so he didn't predict this. He predicted something where you can only make one post every twenty four hours. So if you guys actually listen to what he says. Can, you can only do it every once every 24 hours on this? It's now twice. Oh, twice. So, oh, so yeah, he's prediction. wrong. He's wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Eric, twice at the same time every day. What's that? And pretty soon it'll be 24 times in a day. So Isn't it the same time every day? You no, it notifies you at different that. times. So you get a notification that pops up on your phone. It says, you know, do your be real or whatever. Then you post it. And it is fun to scroll through. I mean, I literally just got on it yesterday, but I've been, I've been watching Ann do it. And it's really fun to see what people are doing on a daily basis, you get an inside track to what's authentically going on in their life. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? You're just sitting there. Well, I think, I think Bobby's second just, question, let, let's all answer it. How would you integrate it? And Tom, you can lead this off. How would you integrate this into your personal branding as an agent or maybe to create deeper relationships with your database might be a better question. How would you integrate this tool? So I, I just downloaded it and I took a picture of us doing the walkthrough. So that's step one is just Perfect. documenting what's going on. Um, I actually like this app because I think realtors are going to become obsessed with it and not focus on their business so we can put them out of business. So I'm personally excited for this for our team. I think that's a win all the way around. So real estate agents, especially in Philadelphia, download this, use it all the time, scroll through it. We'll just sell all the houses. Uh, Dan, how would you use this to enhance your business or your relationships that you're trying to build in your community? Uh, to be honest with you, I, I wouldn't. I think this is going to be a clubhouse round two. Um, I agree with Eric that there are a lot of people on it and that it could be something useful. But for me, for me right now, I'm focusing on what works. I'm on YouTube, TikTok, uh, and Instagram and Facebook. 
Yeah. Do you think an agent should spend time playing with this when they have, when we're talking about, Hey, what's the most important marketing tool you have? I mean, we kind of alluded to it before, but it's actually picking up the phone and making the call and talking to people in your community. The majority, the majority of the people that own homes in your community, I can promise you have never heard of be real. So how much time should you actually spend testing out be real when you know, you know, maybe you're like Paige Steckling where you're like, man, 50% of my business comes from Instagram. Am, am I really going to go take a picture of my bowl of cereal on, on be real and send it to 14 people or <laughs> am I going to focus on, or am I going to focus on what Look, works? Put, Eric, what would you say I'd to that? Say that's a moronic take because although it's funny <laughs> and it's a, a funny example, all these things, all these tools you're using on these apps are going to be implemented into Instagram and TikTok. TikTok. TikTok has already done it. Just like I got really good at Instagram Reels because I started using TikTok really early. I was really early to Instagram yeah. Stories because I had experience with Snapchat Stories and filters and how to actually produce that content. So whether you know you, it takes you five minutes to upload a picture of your cereal, actually, no, it doesn't. It takes you five seconds. And the thing with this app also is you're not spending all day scrolling on it. You look at it for the two minutes that people upload stuff and then you put it down. That's also what's great about it. you're not there's not this dopamine hit every single time you go to it. So I recommend getting I, I on think, it for the future of content. And clearly this is very popular. Seven hundred million people. This is not something yeah. to be ignored. So keep cracking jokes a about lot of, lucky charms. And I will be a lot of, the forward marketing year olds out there. content creator for Ben. So so it, it when I, I downloaded this. The only people that came up were the babysitters for my kids. So I think there, when when you go to your contacts list, so I think there there is some relevancy to who's using it. And I think I'm part of like the greatest generation or the silent generation because I've been generation. in real estate since the uh, 1960s. So yeah. it's I, I think there is you got to get some adoption from older people. I think for it to work to build it into your business. A How little can bit you more. guys be saying? Uh, I'm not things. saying no to it. That you have to get adoption Tom, you're, you're from gonna... older people. Look at TikTok. The like TikTok started as a Gen Z yeah. app, 15 year olds, and all you guys were, were saying, "Oh my god!" Like, it's... I'm not arguing Eric. with you. I downloaded it and used it. I'm saying that's what's going to have to happen for it to become well, a that's viable business. Yeah, probably too. going to happen. Eric, I've never heard of it until to, until today. Uh, to your point, and um, it's the best point you've made. Starting to spend a very little bit of time learning it because you might just get a piece of content on this app that you that would work for you on Instagram. You you might be able to learn something that you can bring over to where you have a larger audience. So I'm never going to be the one to tell you not to you know, be a first mover on these things, you know, it'd be a fool's errand to say that you're going to go and get, you know, you're likely not going to get business out of this or new relationships. You might create deeper relationships with some folks who are on it. And certainly if there's a friend circle that you know of that sends you referrals, get in there, stay top of mind with them. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think learning about it would be, would be fine. I, I don't think, you know, it, it remains to be seen whether it will be a clubhouse. Who said that? Was that that was Dan said it could be a clubhouse? But clubhouse also being be. on clubhouse created connections and then also help people's skills with public speaking yeah. and help create little networks that now allows yep. them to do more masterminds on Zoom, masterminds on Discord, masterminds on YouTube, whatever the case may be. Like I, I got a lot of skills and podcasting skills and stuff from Clubhouse. So regardless of the fact that Clubhouse is now yeah. defunct and nobody cares about it, I still got connections and learned from it. Agree with that, Eric, but we think about it a little bit differently because we're running a media company. So if you're an agent and you've got limited time, I, I wouldn't want you to get down the rabbit hole of, and you're saying, Eric, and I haven't used it, that there's not there's much no opportunity to get lost on consumption like there is in, in Four TikTok. minutes a day. So that's a good Two point. minutes maybe, Four minutes a 10 a.m. It notifies you. Yeah. I'm going to do a be real, eight o'clock at night. It does. And, and, and Tom, I think you know where I'm going with this though, there's only so many things you can do. There's only so much capacity you have as an agent who's going to survive in this market and getting laser focused on 80 to 90% of your time on a couple of things that really are going to crush for you. And you can just keep working on each and every single day is probably where you should spend the majority of your time. But I, I agree with that. I mean, we, we've talked about some strategies that we're using now where Byron and I are, you know, we're talking about agent led trainings and then we record the content for them. We produce it for them so they can go out and sell houses. Like, I mean, that that's what, to me, when I, you know, when I was in production, it was, how can I sell more houses? What's going to be the highest and best use of my time? So 
I, I do agree there that the majority of people and, and Paige Stecklin, I mean, she's a unicorn getting 50% of her business from Instagram. I mean, that, that's not the norm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm totally with you on this. Highest and best use of time. All right. Just be Huge real. Part. Don't be a realtor. Be real. Download the app. Uh, Eric, do you have a, do you get a kickback on this? No, I mean, I, I just, I, the way you're handling this is, is frightening. That's all I'm going to say. I think, you know, the four minutes, <laughs> See a BAM divorce the four the minutes oh, wow. people could spend on this, you know, is really not going to hurt their real estate business. I think they could still be the knowledge broker as you guys love to pound into our heads by uploading a picture with their feet up on the couch for 30 seconds. Get on Be Real yeah. and follow me at The Broke Agent. All right. I just had an important phone call I missed. Thanks to you guys. So let's wrap this thing up. What a great walkthrough. Uh, Dan, look out for Amazon Prime Box. I'm sending you a 12 pack of Kleenex so you can use over the next two weeks as you rant and rave around social media of how right, do I, do I unacknowledged you are. Do I, do I get a final thought here? As, as I'm sure. going to interrupt you. Yeah, sure. I went into the Tom Ferry Success Summit, and I think Eric can attest this, very serious. And I realized very yeah. quickly that the place that I'm at in my business, I have been very fortunate to do very well, but I did not have the systems and the structures in place that I need as this market corrects itself to compete and sustain and to grow. So I was at the, the conference every morning, actually taking notes. And I've now since been implementing every single day. So me being on this like psychotic little two week hiatus has nothing to do with BAM, has nothing to do with, with anything oh. other than the fact that I am just working on my own business. I'm implementing the systems and the structures that I've learned from Tom, from you, from other people. So that way, by the time that I am your age or hopefully sooner, I can be at your level or above. Well, it. I'll say this. Danny Deals is way ahead of me at your age than I was at that age. So you're doing some great things. Right, I'm not sure. talking about you diving into your business. I want you to do that. I'm talking about the shots you were taking at me and Eric, the direct <laughs> shots. One YouTube comment. You guys so. are dying. talking about thin skin. Jesus age. And, uh, that's it. We'll wrap it up. Appreciate all of you guys would love for you to consider subscribing to the BAM channel where you can catch this walkthrough. Or if you're listening, would love for you to consider reviewing this. Drop us a comment. Who in your office has the thinnest skin you can leave their name tag them if you'd like we'll see you guys next week on the walk